want to kick us off, Ian, and tell us a little bit about your your journey? Of course. So the first thing to say to the audience is that one of the things that you always do is rehearse absolutely through to the end, well before the event. It's not a compliment to ourselves that we've done that, but there it is. But hello. Before I started my service with a well-known computer company, I did lots of work experience. Uh, school, holiday, milk delivery, Christmas post, farm labouring, gap year insurance with an insurance company, vacation work with a holiday firm, walking secretary, uh, and in companies making dolls and rivets, teaching, fluid to a higher national evening class, and later A maths, A level maths and statistics to a local school. And in early 1963, the cold winter, engineering research in Germany, where my fellow students marched in progress, in protest, when the goal banned Britain from joining the community and teased me that my Austin Healy Sprite only sounded fast. And these experiences were priceless, as were the consequences of an idea that came to me in a London cafe one wet 1961 afternoon while I was waiting for a girlfriend. And although this was outside my PhD scope, my supervisor insisted that I should develop and write it up without his name on it. And later, many years later, over tea at a manufacturing conference, a Professor John Campbell introduced himself, saying that coming across my paper, he'd wanted to meet me for 20 years because he's decided to, career, to, to, to devote his career to developing the idea uh, based on it. And from that one outcome, there had been porosity free, so-called porosity free castings, die castings, which uh, gave a Formula One Grand Prix team a sustained several year winning advantage. And then 10 years later still, a Dr. Hamid Mughal told me that John's technology had also been critical to the success of the production line he had built to make BMCA series engine blocks, uh, 40,000 a week. And I think acorns and oak trees come to mind on that. And then I left Lucas to join a company that I'd never heard of for three reasons. One, because it had recruited several colleagues whom I particularly respected. Another, through stumbling across its advertisement for systems engineers. And the third, something for another day. My first 10 years at IBM was spent helping about 200 companies help use computers to solve engineering and manufacturing problems, like creating digital models of aircraft structures and car chassis forging dies. Uh, manufacturing cardboard boxes, making marine components. And I had the luck of leading the software team for something called the Molin System 24 Unmanned Machine Manufacturing System, which was one of Harold Wilson's 1967 white heat of technology investments. And I ran three day Fortran courses where we taught engineering executives to solve problems themselves while they were there. And then I was eventually asked to manage some talented systems engineers. And then in 1980, IBM UK had a root and branch reorganization, as companies have. And that coincided with the, absent, the, the, the urgent need for the company to fix some software related business problems, which gave me a wonderful break, which was to be invited to create a freestanding operation, uh, which uh, one of my 32 IBM managers described as a skunk works, turning good ideas into marketable products. And I ran this for 17 years. And after I retired, the company found a number of other things it wanted me to do that kept me in, in part-time employment. Uh, talk about luck in that respect. And as I move uh, well through, one special part of my IBM life began by chance through being the only person in the Birmingham office when my manager needed someone to look after a 1964 summer intern. 19 year old Valerie wowed customers by using computers to solve a variety of linear programming pr problems, rather special those days, and hugely enjoying supervising her and recalling the value of my own work experience, I developed 
and for 35 years managed IBM's pre-university gap program, cumulatively employing more than a thousand students. And one whom I reserve for work in my group was a certain uh, founder of Raspberry Pi, Eben Upton. Student two-week introductory courses were, were actually designed and run by their students who were elected by their peers. Uh, their first parties always occurred within 48 hours, uh, perhaps uh, disappointingly, never including me. I, I tried to place everyone with proven supportive managers, made sure they were well-mentored and positively encouraged them to enhance their jobs. And most went on to great careers, uh, many like IBM with, I, with Valerie in IBM, but by no means all in IT. Uh, one example being the current Oxford Chinese history professor, uh, a certain Rana Mitter. My ever tolerant wife hosted student entertained summer parties, and we were in turn guests at some fabulous events, including a wedding in Italy in Michelangelo's birthplace. Those who uh, have kept in touch all recall their uh, initial interview, particularly facing a problem deliberately flighted to be virtually insoluble unless they ask for help. And they remember my closing question. What do you understand by the expression being lucky? And those listening, how would you answer that? And finally, a tip to improve your life chances. Thank people sincerely, uh, as I do now, for listening to someone whose career began, began before your parents were even born. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. No, uh, a fascinating story. I, I can't wait to, at some point, uh, take in the longer version of that in some kind of memoirs. I, I hope you're planning it at some point in the future. Um, no, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, on to uh, other people around the room. And I, unfortunately, I can't remember the order we're meant to be doing this in. So I, I'm going to go to John Nunn uh, next, if that's OK. John, do you want to introduce yourself and give us a kind of five minutes of, of your meandering career? Yep, sure. Thank you, Rich. Um, so my name's John Nunn, um, and I started my um, IT career a long, long time ago. Um, when I was eight, I wrote my first commercial application. Um, but about 25 years ago, I set up my first um, company, um, dropped out of the university and set up a software design and development company. Following on from that, um, we had issues with year 2000 and then 9-11. So I left um, that job and actually took a job with a company that some people might be familiar with, probably the only one most people will be familiar with, an organization called Games Workshop, uh, where I set up and ran uh, their systems coordination, which meant I looked after their warehouse and um, foundry side of the business. Um, after long, long hours and many hours having to turn around on the motorway to get back to work, um, I then took, then left that job. Um, several sort of parts of career later, I ended up in Coventry as the development manager for a company called Objectivity, um, where I helped them introduce virtualization into their systems and manage the Microsoft development teams. I left Focus to go and work for another, sorry, left Objectivity to go and work for a company called Focus, where we designed and developed um, finan uh, software systems for financial organizations. After that, I went and was a contractor for a couple of years, um, which was great fun. Got to keep a lot of the money at the time. It was pre um, all the changes to IR35, which meant you actually got to keep a lot more of the money and uh, effectively pay less tax, which was great. Um, but I got the opportunity to then work within the NHS and help design and build some products. So I formed yet another company that sat and did that for 10 years, um, which also helped deliver business support to companies um, through European, through Coventry University and Warwick University. Um, a few years doing that, 10, well, 10 years doing that, I decided it's time to get a proper job and ticked the box on LinkedIn saying I was looking for work. 
um, one of the world's largest consultancy firms, um, Hap Gemini, called me up and said, would you like to come and be a security architect? So that's where I am now. I sit and deliver and help companies support their uh, secure environments. So I help design solutions that are secure in deployment to help protect things like credit card payment systems, to help protect personal information stored on computer systems. Um, and that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Fantastic, thanks, John. And, and, and by the sounds of it, you've done many, many things, and we'll come back to kind of some of the history of that in a little bit, if that's okay. Um, if I can move on now to uh, Duncan, if that's okay, uh, Duncan Robson, um, if uh, you'd like to give us five minutes of, of your life. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Can indeed, yeah. Lovely. Okay, so um, my history with, with IT started when I was 10. So I had a, a ZX80 computer with 1K memory, um, which... Uh, I, I used to try and program with a bit of help from my dad um, and in the end it, I couldn't get to do what I needed to do so I had to go right into the machine code and learn Z80 machine code. I uh, then moved up to a 6502 processor with an Atari and again learned machine code and this I think this this hands-on approach has, has followed me throughout out my career. Um, I then actually went to the degree in physics and a master's degree in robotics um, after school um, and was looking around about what to do next and uh, joined IBM as a graduate in 1993. So this is my 29th year with the company. Um, and a little bit like uh, Ian and John, I've had quite quite a varied career, actually still all inside IBM. So I started off um, in uh, what we called operations. So I was managing computers and we, we worked night shift and keeping them working and keeping them running which actually is a really good education about how the, how the business actually worked at a, at a grassroots level. Um, I then had lots of jobs where I was um, what we call the systems programmer. So I worked on mainframe technology and I worked on Unix technology and I worked on um, Intel Windows technology and networking and lots and lots of different sorts of technical, technical roles. Um, and then uh, in the late 90s, I was introduced to a, a chap who had the title of IT architect. And I thought that, that sounds really interesting. Um, I wasn't quite sure what an architect was. I was also I was quite hands-on at that point. Um, and uh, did a few courses through IBM and, and, and loved it. And for me, you know, architecture, IT architecture is very much analogous to a building architect. So you, 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 you have the vision, you draw out the plans, you have to be able to have talk to all the different, all the different people who, who uh, will, will put um, elements into the solution. Um, my daughter, interestingly, is actually reading building architecture at university now, and there's some real similarities between the work that she does and the work that I do. Um, and then, so I became an IT architect um, 20 years ago, and I've, I've specialised in the retail sector. Um, and I've been working with lots of very, very large companies, helping them solve business problems. So this is taking up a problem they might have around something like their supply chain or how do they market to people or how do they understand their customers or how do they get things on the shelf quicker or how do they do returns better and taking that business problem and, and translating it into a set of requirements and then from there into a set of solutions and then actually going to implement that and then checking whether you've actually fixed the problem that you just um, tried to fix in the first place. So. My role spans everything now that IBM does, um, which includes things like IBM research. So uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I could be talking around a database technology. I could be talking around how to take a new retailer to market. Um, this week, we were, I was, was with IBM research. We were talking about human biomes and a thing called smell ontology because IBM develops a whole series of artificial intelligence solutions to develop perfume. So never, never a dull day. Um, I also, in my say spare time, but it, as well as my professional life, I also um, lecture at universities. So I've, I've lectured at Warwick University about IT architecture, and I help out an awful lot as well with our graduate programs inside IBM. So one of my favourite times of the year is we have a program called Extreme Blue, um, which you can apply to between your second and third year at university. And we have um, four teams of, 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 of four um, undergraduates who come and work with us for 12 weeks at our Hursley Labs. Um, we set them a challenge which has been set by one of our customers and then we work through 
with all of IBM research and all of the IBM capabilities behind that to try and solve a problem. Um, and it's just brilliant. I just I just love the the excitement and the enthusiasm that you get working with the with the undergrads. And then we we we, we take the idea and, and then hopefully take it to market and sometimes even patent it as well. So um, really really enthusiastic. I've loved my time in IT. Um, I can't think of a better job for me personally. Um, and I'm interested to see what what happens next. So that's me. Uh, no, fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah. That sounds fascinating. It sounds like you found yourself in a really good place with it all and, and loving every minute of it. And um, I'll come back round in a second and ask some questions because I think you've already alluded to some of the weirdest things uh, you've been involved in. I'd, I'd be interested to get that sort of take from all the panellists in a minute. So get thinking if you're a panellist. Um, um, next, if... Go on. Just one thing I forgot to say as well. I'm also involved in quantum computing now. So I've gone right back to brass tacks. I'm now effectively programming quantum computers in assembly language. <laughs> Wow, but then see that still blows my mind the whole quantum computer thing. So but yeah, we'll come we'll come back to to that in a bit. Um, if next, uh, can I come to you, Jason? I'm I'm not too sure I've actually seen you on it yet, so I'm hoping you're on the line. So Jason, can if you're there, can you get us five minutes of your life, please? Uh, hi, I'm here. Um, hopefully you can see and hear me okay. Apologies for the shocking webcam quality. I'm at I'm back in my parents' house. Um. I, I'm not wearing eyeliner and my I'm not usually this dark. <laughs> um, so I'm 24. I work at National Grid at the moment uh, in Warwick um, in the Midlands. I'm a, user, I'm a UX designer, user experience designer. So what I do is I take business and user requirements um, and turn those into software that works for people. At the moment, I'm helping to update some software that allows customers that we have who um, own big solar farms, wind farms, that sort of thing, helps them to connect those projects to the super grid uh, in, a, in a timely fashion. Um, there's various other projects going on as well in National Grid that we're working on that helps engineers connect all these substations to, um, to power stations and helps find the best routes to lay cables and that sort of thing. Um, so all quite interesting stuff. Uh, joined National Grid after studying user experience design at Norwich University of the Arts, which this is the city that I'm sat in now. This is where I'm from. I'm from Norwich, Norfolk, east of England. Um, studied there for three years, uh, graduated 2020, and then I was fortunate enough to get into National Grid's graduate scheme. Before that, I worked for several high schools in the Norwich area, uh, helping to deploy IT. So uh, we helped to deploy Office 365 and Windows 8 and when, later Windows 10 to uh, several schools, a couple of high schools, a couple of junior schools, one infant school. Uh, that was quite interesting, being an IT technician and doing that. We got quite heavily involved with Microsoft. Um, we were a Microsoft like showcase organization, so we promote their hardware and their software, even got to go out to their HQ in Seattle and learn a lot more about that, which was really great. Um, and spoke at TEDx Norwich when I was 18 about the importance of introducing technology to the education system. And if you find my talk on YouTube entitled uh, Redefining Teaching and Learning with Technology, you can see all the comments say, Jason Brown predicted 2020 and remote learning and using Skype to learn and that sort of thing uh, some four years before the pandemic struck. So, yeah, um, I guess you could say I started off in ed tech and now in the energy sector just goes to show that you can move sectors quite easily, even when you're young and quite inexperienced like myself. Fantastic. I, I, I would love your predictability skills, I guess, uh, or the prediction skills. Uh, uh, while I've quickly got you, we'll come back to proper questions later, but do you know the lottery numbers for this weekend? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't. If I did, I would be keeping that to myself. Right. No problem. So we found your limit. So you can predict educational trends four years in advance, but but not lottery numbers this weekend. That's fine. OK, we, we've got some parameters to work. So that's brilliant. Um, on, on the topic of user experience, uh, can I come to you, Vanessa, if that's OK? Uh, and you kind of give us uh, five minutes of, of your career and, and where you find yourself now. Yes, of course. So. Um, sorry, I've just got a message pop up on my screen. Um, 
you can still hear me and see me yet. Yeah? <laughs> and I, so I can totally hear you. Working, yeah. Great. I'm working as a lead user experience design researcher for a bank. Um, and um, my my career, um, I've been doing this um, type of work, so UX research, um, since about 2017. And um, in UX, and user experience, which is really about making systems um, that are that are very usable and really well designed, and also introducing new ideas, um, new new initiatives um, in digital systems as well. Um, so, as well as the, the actual design work, um, what's needed as well is is research. So the reason we need research is um, to evaluate systems that are currently in use and improve them. So work out if there's any issues with using them, um, iron out those issues, um, and also to design new systems or introduce new functionality, design them in the best way we can. So they're really like the best designs we can do. Um, in terms of my day-to-day -day work, I think it's split into two areas. So there's strategy, which is about thinking about medium and long-term planning. So what digital products are going to look like in the future um, that we need to develop um, on a kind of a large scale. And then there's some really detailed work that goes on at component level. So when you're using um, any kind of IT system, really looking at the detail of how you perform different tasks to do what you want to do with that system. Um, and improving that. Um, so day-to-day -day work, um, I do a, a, a wide variety of um, different, different activities with participants. So that's people who actually use the systems that we're designing and improving and building for them. So the way we might carry out research, we, we always try and involve people at every stage of the design process. So things we might do are things like interviews, um, we might do usability testing, which is kind of close observation of how people are using systems. Um, we might do focus groups to find out people's views on a particular topic or area of interest. So a group of people who we will um, do a structured discussion with and, and, and make those findings. We might do diary studies, which are um, something where we give somebody a diary to record very particular um, observations about how they use a digital system um, again to find out you know any any issues they're having work out how we can improve things we might observe people whether for example they're at work and we're trying to improve the systems they use at work or or elsewhere um, and um, it could be systems that lots of people see every day like websites making sure people can can do what they want to do on the website and um, for example you know, if, if, if they're looking for some information or they're trying to buy something, um, they're trying to apply for something, it can really be, be any kind of um, task that the user needs to do. Um, and then it can also be systems that people use kind of behind the scenes, so p systems that people use at work that maybe the public wouldn't see, but are really, really important that that works well so that they can support their customers or, or whatever they need to do as part of their jobs. Um, and I think as Jason mentioned there, with um, being able to work in lots of different sectors, that's absolutely true of myself. So um, after doing my master's degree in user experience design, um, I worked um, as a postgraduate researcher. I worked on um, interaction design and policy um, regarding drones um, at Coventry University. I then worked um, at Howlands, which is um, a trade supplier of kitchens. Um, then I um, did a couple of other roles um, in, in different sectors before moving to my current role um, at a bank. So it really does sort of illustrate, you know, you can work in pretty much any any kind of sector, any industry you can think of, Every everything really needs good design and this design all needs to be backed up um, by research. Just wanted to mention some of the skills as well that are really useful. So I did um, uh, my first degree, um, I was studying philosophy. I then did an education degree um, and was teaching computer science for about six years. And then I um, and then obviously did my master's, but I think it was really valuable to study education um, and social sciences. That was really important in, in developing the right kind of skills 
but I, I'd say um, really it's about scientific methods that I use in day to day. So if you like science, if you like psychology, particularly cognitive psychology, design and computing, or any any kind of combination of those, um, then this is a career that I think you know would be good to consider. Oh, fantastic! Thank you very much. And it's it, uh, just to pick up on one thing you said there, which I think fascinates me more than anything at the moment about the IT industry, which is once upon a time you went into the IT industry and worked for an IT company. Now every single company has so much software development, user experience development, all those kind of things going on that actually just about every company that you come across now has has an element of that. I mean, I think Ocado, as an example of, of one of the biggest um, developers of, of artificial intelligence and robotics in the UK at the moment and that's a bit bizarre when you think they're just an online supermarket but it's just how every single industry is permeates through now and so yeah fan fantastic thank you very much um, last but no means least uh, so I come to you Mark um, and then and then hopefully John Rendell if you can uh, hear me uh, if we've had any questions through if you can uh, line those up for me if not I will start firing some questions in directions but uh, first of all, Mark, five minutes uh, of your career, if that's okay. Hi, everyone. Yes, so um, my name is Mark Warner. Um, I, 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 my, my IT career started a little bit slowly. Um, I couldn't wait to leave school. Um, I struggled to learn. I wasn't very smart. I, I wasn't a good good student. Uh, may have also been something to do with being bullied on an almost daily basis when I was at school. Um, but I left, I left school with three, GC, three GCSEs at grade C or above um, and an RSA in IT literacy. And it was that RSA and IT literacy that really kind of helped propel me into my role that I'm in today. Um, as bad as those grades sound, they were way better than my teachers or parents ever expected. Um, and consequently, I struggled to find a job. Um, I was told that I either needed to find a job or go to college. Now, I didn't want to go to college because I didn't like school. Um, but I went to Tar Hill College um, in Coventry and I did a BTEC in business and finance. And I really enjoyed it, so much so that um, about three months into the course, um, I got offered a job that I'd applied for before I started and I turned it down. Um, my parents were, were horrified because I just turned down a job that was actually paying a reasonable salary. Um, and given how bad my, my studies had been up till that point, it seemed like a silly thing to do. Um, but I turned it down, I carried on studying and that then led me into Coventry University and to various other things. So today I'm, I'm 46 years old. Um, I've been with the same company for 22 years, um, working in increasingly senior roles and working with global teams. So how did I go from being the, the, the child with the, the youngster with less than four GCSEs in, in equivalent um, to where I am today? Well, two things really changed. One, I discovered um, BBC Micros. Um, there was mention of the 6502 processor early on. Um, it's a computer that was in schools in the, the 80s and early 90s. Um, based on the 6502 um, and I went to a careers event called Careers 2000. This was this was very revolutionary forward thinking because this was in the early 90s um, and it was about um, I met with a, a person there from Association of Accounting Technicians and it was that conversation that propelled me into the BTEC at Tar Hill College. It propelled me into a different learning environment I'd ever experienced before and just that one conversation in an event similar to this had a massive impact on my life. Um, I, I enjoyed college so much, I went to university, I did a BA in business computing. Um, I then went off and worked as a software developer um, for a local software company called Savant, um, who's no longer uh, no longer in Coventry. Um, but that was that was my first, first job. I was writing um, uh, various software development languages, but mainly focused on database design and worked on things for railway privatization um, for the healthcare systems and while I was doing that I continued studying um, part-time on evening classes and did a postgraduate certificate and a postgraduate diploma and then finally went off and did my MBA. Um, and one of the things that I think I've learned from IT in my, my time in this career is that IT is always changing, there's always something new to learn. Um, so I started out in C and C++ programming. I went through database design and all sort of re relational databases through multi-dimensional databases um, and all sorts of different ways of building fast, efficient data querying, data reporting and analysis techniques. Um, and then went into discussing, I liked, I liked working with customer. I liked working with people that were requesting systems. 
and started working as a business analyst and then as a project manager. And more recently as a head of a project management team um, of 18 project managers, uh, I was managing that team within, uh, within my current organization. Um, and now I'm, I'm an agile coach working with teams globally to try and improve the, the efficiency and the effectiveness of those teams in developing software. So as my career went on, I became more and more people focused. So from the, from the child that hated school and struggled to learn and didn't understand other people, I've ended up being a lifelong learner working with people. Um, and via that route was, was getting into technology, getting into computers. They made more sense to me than people did. Um, and then being able to start to work with people as, as a, using that technology was just fantastic. Um, so for any of you that are deciding on your career future at the moment, some advice I'd give you is never stop believing in yourself. Um, even when others around you say, oh no, you couldn't do that, or actually that's above you and beyond you, it, it's not. Um, I went off and I redid my GCSEs in maths. I redid other, other qualifications along the way. Um, in, in six months for my maths GCSE and year at school, I was doing it for two years and failed it. Um, so there's always ways of doing things, different learning opportunities, different ways of, of learning, different environments, different jobs, different opportunities. Something will eventually fit with, with who you are and what you're interested in. And the great thing with technology roles, they're so varied and so there's so much variety and so much of an opportunity to, as we talked about, others have talked about changing from different types of organization, different sectors, but also changing different types of role. So that, that was no, me. Absolutely. No, fantastic. No, thank you very much. Uh, and um, yeah, absolutely. It, it, I, I guess the, the key thing there is it's never too late either to, to change or pick up a new skill or go and do a new, a new thing. And so actually, if you are in school or college or uni at the moment, you're thinking, right, I need to pick a career path and that's the direction I'm going to go in actually you have got the rest of your working life to play about with this and work out what you want to do and move around different roles and and you may even do the same role but a different organization it's very different no fantastic no thank you very much um so uh john uh john rendell have we had any questions come in or do you want me to start ad-libbing some no rich we haven't had any questions yet Okay, well, for those of you who are watching, please do send them in. Otherwise, you're just going to get bored of, of my questions. Um, but I'm going to go. I'm going to start with a bit of a quirky one first, if that's okay. Um, which is kind of where's the the weirdest thing, place you found yourself, or the weirdest project you've ended up working on? Something that you never dreamed being in your career w would kind of happen to you, and it could be something that's very very proud of, or, or something a bit surreal. I mean, I, just while you're all thinking about that, I'll give you a quick example from my life. I'm a software developer. I picked it because I like sitting in indoor environments next to my computer and, and being just a bit of a, a, a geek in a, in a dark room somewhere. That's what I, I want to, to do. And then fairly recently, over the last couple of years, I ended up with a project to do with photography of horse events. And I find myself in the middle of a field on top of a hill where it's, wind, it's blowing a gale, it's raining down on me, surrounded by horses doing dressage and cross country runs and those kind of things. And, and it just felt like such an alien world to the one I thought I should be in as a software developer. But I was there to develop solutions for that client and you, you kind of have to live it for real. So, um, yes, uh, surreal places you found yourself or, or things you, you, um, you wouldn't have expected. So um, should I pick on should I go Duncan first? Um, so there's two that come to mind. Um, the first one was trying to explain around about database schemas in a casino in Vegas was quite strange. Um, and you're sort of thinking this isn't this is slightly different to where I'm sitting. Um, the other thing I've done as part of my career is as, as well as doing IT, I also do a lot of music. And as part of an IT event, I found myself singing a solo in the machine hall at the Manchester Science Museum um, <laughs> in Latin. Um, so that also that was that was slightly different to what my normal day job is. I, I, I must say, as, as we said on the call, I do think IT is so is so pervasive in our in in our lives today, and also all the organisations that we work with. You can literally find yourself anywhere. Um, there's some really really yeah, it, it, it can take you wherever you'd like to go. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Vanessa, anything spring to mind? Um, n not anything, you know, you know, really, really colourful, but I would just second, you know, the fact that it really can take you anywhere because um, as a researcher, it's really important to 
understand um, people's perspectives on the digital systems they're using in a very, very real way. So one of the things that's really important um, in any UX research role is to um, do, do observations of people in, in their work or, or whatever context it is that the system, you know, uh, mm. where, wherever it is. Um, so in all of my roles, you know, um, whether, whether um, for example, I, I worked um, in an audiovisual company that basically um, provides huge screens for events and, and gets the audiovisual systems working. And I was involved in the sort of behind the scenes control of those systems. Um, and of course, I, I got um, at one, on one occasion, um, I was at one of the events. I was observing the people using the system and, you know, it was an incredible experience, you know, in the middle of London. Um, and, um, you know, I've been um, able to to observe people in, in their work, you know, at, um, at uh, branches of the um, kitchen supplier I was working on. So I really understood all of their roles. And then, of course, in my current role, I'm really understanding, um, you know, the the, uh, the experience of people working with systems um, in the bank. So um, it's just an amazing way of learning about all sorts of um, different different fields you go through your career and how people experience their working lives as well as um, specifically the digital systems they're using. Absolutely yes yeah. the variety can be immense really uh, of the, the kind of things you can find yourself working on there fantastic thank you. Um, Ian I'll come to you I think you alluded earlier on to find yourself um, in some strange locations I guess what, what was what was the weirdest? I guess setting up this skunk works is the was the oddest experience in the sense that there were two or three reasons why this was to happen uh, one of which was that our sales director was determined uh, by the way 20 years before connect for health that ibm would provide a solution for hospital management and my group was asked to do it on the basis would you believe that we would sell 157 systems at $10,000 each with no license requirement in terms of maintenance after we'd sold it. Uh, you might not believe it, but that's the way that sales worked occasionally in those days. Now, the really interesting point was that uh, I would not have been able to set up my group, probably, uh, without that and various other things. The outcome was uh, good. We delivered on spec to time. Uh, the uh, other aspect wasn't quite so good, uh, and it's something that I had forecast. I thought not 157 that we would sell, but maybe one to the one where our sales director had a particularly good personal relationship with the hospital. And I was wrong. We sold none. Oh, wow. Wow. And, and, and a fascinating business model when you consider today's IT market as well. The idea of, of selling selling a thing and then leaving it with the customer rather than our current day monthly rolling subscriptions and, and things like that. It's a completely different business model as well. But no, fantastic. No, thank you. Um, Mark, can I come to you? Um, anything kind of spring to mind of a place you didn't or a place you didn't think you'd find yourself or a project you never thought you'd find yourself working on? Yeah, a couple of things, and nothing quite as uh, exotic as some of the early ones. Um, I never thought I'd be travelling um, internationally for work, um, and that was something I ended up doing um, with my job. I worked for a, a company called Kantar, a market research company based in Warwick, and they've got a lot of offices in the US and elsewhere around the world. Um, so I got to spend quite a bit of time in Austin, Texas, um, which is somewhere that for me is just my second home. Um, I love country music. I um, I, I, I just fit in there better than I do in the UK. Uh, I definitely fit in better in Austin, Texas than, than here in, in Warwick. Um, so that was that was one of them. But the other thing was just working with people globally. Um, I, I really wish I'd spent more time on languages and learning languages at school um, because I now work with teams spanning everything from India through to multiple places in Latin America, um, Poland and various other places in Europe um, and some new ones coming online soon as well. So there'll be additional languages in there. Um, and working with all those teams, it, it, it would have been great if I could have actually had the language skills to be able to communicate, and not just in English. Um, sadly, that's something I, I certainly lack in. Um, so that, that's kind of 
kind of the key one is the globalization of, of IT and the opportunity it provides uh, is, is my thing. Yeah, absolutely. And and the weirdest of reasons can force you to jump on a plane and, and end up somewhere else. And don't get me wrong, we're working on those trips, but there's always a bit of time to go and sightsee and enjoy it as well. No, fantastic. Thank you. Um, uh, John, if I can come to you, um, anything weird or wacky that springs to mind for you? Um, there's a few, but unfortunately I can't tell anybody about them. Um, <laughs> that it's about 20 odd years ago I was running a training course um, down in uh, Boscombe Down. Um, I don't know whether or not anybody knows Boscombe Down but it's right next door to Thornton Down and it's also where the, uh, well I, I won't spoil the, <laughs> the story so I was running the training course and then all of a sudden there was a huge amount of noise. Couldn't hear anybody think. You look outside the window and there they are doing practicing and training for vertical takeoff and landing with uh, Hawker Sidley um, Sea Harriers. Um, the most bizarre thing I've ever seen, really. Um, very strange, very odd, and not kind of what you'd expect in the middle of a uh, IT training session. No, so even IT training can be a very varied career when you've got uh, fighter jets taking off next to you. Incredible. Um, uh, Jason, uh, sorry, last but not least, but uh, anything you can think of that kind of really stands out to you? Yeah, a few weird ones. Um, I used to do a lot of freelance work when I was at uni and I worked on loads of different projects, mainly software dev ones, but for people in all sorts of industry. Uh, I did some work for a local glass blower and I was able to go and see them make glass baubles and stuff like that, uh, which was really interesting um so that was a you know sort of thinking oh you know i didn't think that making their website would lead to me being able to go over and see the kind of things that they do but that was one of them did some work for uh, my cousin who needed some software uh that would print postage labels and when i was testing that my room literally just became filled with test labels i was literally sitting in a sea of postage labels Again, uh, one of those kind of, hmm, was not expecting this scenarios. And then I guess most recently, I've landed up on various substations and, and places like that with my work for National Grid, uh, walking around high voltage substations, learning about how they all work because the software that I'm working on helps people connect to them. So it's interesting and helpful to know exactly how they work and what you can expect to find on site, really. Um, so, yeah echoing what the others have said really you never know the sort of places where you may end up it's certainly not always sat in front of a computer bashing out code or drawing pretty boxes on figma no, absolutely and and the idea of, of ending up in a substation as well you can this nice quiet software job that's what you've gone for and all of a sudden you're in a situation where you touch the wrong thing and you're going to end up in a different county just absolutely incredible uh no Fantastic. Uh, John, uh, Rendell, any questions come in so far? No, we've still not got any questions, Rich. In which case, I'll continue trying to be entertaining. <laughs> well, well, what I was going to suggest is I could hmm. click the button to unmute all the participants. Well, just, just before you do that, John, I, uh, there's, there's at least one other question that I want to kind of get round to everybody. So we, should we do that first, then we'll, we'll, we'll do the free-for-all afterwards, if that's all right? Okay, right. Perfect. Well, the, so the other question I was going to say is, uh, is ask around what advice you'd be giving people in the audience. So what bits of advice or, or tips would you be giving people based on your career and your journey? And it could be avoid so and so, uh, not an individual person but avoid a certain thing or you should really do more of these kind of things ian so i come to you first on that one um any sort of tips and guidance you'd, you'd give out thank you and, and i thought this is something that matters enormously and this notion of sharing uh, with those listening is worthwhile um, so i i've pre prepared some notes so the first thing to say is seek a mentor at least one and keep that going through your life. And a mentor, by the way, is a person defined by the dictionary as a wise counselor and a faithful friend. And I've certainly been very lucky in this respect with a couple of examples. Uh, one was my college tutor, and he steered me 
into engineering after I was struggling with what I would describe as sleep inducing an impenetrable university mathematics. And a second particularly notable one was, a, was an IBM colleague. 30 years ago, and by the way, he's still a friend, I found myself seriously under threat, helpless and distraught. And he navigated me to safety. And by the way, being a mentor, as I think several of you already know, for the speakers, can be very rewarding. So I commend this to you as well. And here, if you can tolerate it, I'm not quickly, a nine more suggestions uh, complementing something Mark was talking about earlier. The first, never ever reply to a sensitive email or tweet without sleeping on it. And then to go on, avoid impolitely interrupting others because that describes, it destroys your credibility. Never assume favors will be automatically returned. Use Google to see what completed staff work means and practice it. And you are likely to move forward faster than you can ever imagine. Learn how joined up systems engineering beats walking in the dark. Join, and I certainly relish this, Join organizations where you like the people and culture. Practice lifelong learning, uh, which by way of example, is taking my local electrician along the road from his very disadvantaged beginnings towards engineering institution fellowship. Uh, it's worth taking an interest in BCS or any other professional life because there you're likely to discover the benefit of giving is just as great as receiving. And the last one, probably most relevant to people listening in, is for teenagers who are interested in best of class STEM apprenticeship coupled with further or higher education. Have a very good look at what Warwickshire College Group's website will offer you. Thank you, Rick. No, no, thank, thank you very much. I've um, I've got a picture, you can't see it unfortunately, but behind me of the lyrics to a song that was released in the 90s called Wear Sunscreen. It's all the the advice that, uh, I think it was originally a, a, a speech that Mary Schmidt gave. I think I want another version of that, Ian, if that's okay, next to it, of those uh, hints you've just given. Because I think some of it is very, very salient and very important, especially around the mentor-mentee thing. I think uh, that kind of relationship is, is really rewarding on both sides. Um, so fantastic, thank you for that. Um, uh, John, if I can come to you actually, um, what, what sort of tips would you be giving to people in the audience? Um, well, Ian stole my thunder with the mentor uh, piece. Um, <laughs> I think everybody will agree that's probably one of the most important things you can do to help yourself is find, find trusted advisors who you can reach out to. Um, I would say be true to yourself, um, trust in yourself, take risks there's nothing wrong with failing what's wrong is not learning from failing so take the risk fail fast and move forward um i think that's probably really the <laughs> i can say um yeah i know i think, it's, fan I think it's fantastic advice yeah take, take the risk fail fast obviously take measured risks um, I'm not talking about sort of jumping off uh, tall buildings or anything for a short run, uh, sorry for a short sort of thrill. Um, but uh, but yeah, take measured risks and 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 yeah, as you say, don't be scared of failing. Uh, Vanessa, is there anything you'd like to sort of pass on as a, uh, even if it's just one thing that that springs to mind as a bit of advice? Yeah, I think just sort of continually evaluating where you would like to develop experience as well as skills um, and um, potentially finding opportunities um, to do that um, and I think um, I mean that does time with lifelong learning definitely but um, I think in a lot of companies there's opportunities for you know um, with just um, developing skills in different areas. Um, it's possible to sort of move between um, related occupations. And I've seen that um, in business I've worked in people sort of moving to slightly different roles, trying it out. 
um, and you know speaking to to managers and, and people who who can support you in in developing your skills because I think it's always really good to appreciate um, the the perspectives of colleagues um, in different roles around you as well. Oh, fantastic! No, thank you very much. You, 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 yeah, surround yourself with good people and, and take that on board as well. No, very, no thank you very much. Uh, Jason, if we can come to you if that's okay. Yeah, I was having this discussion last night with um, a girl I know who's at the uni that I studied at, and she asked me, how do I go about getting a job after uni? And honestly, I what I've said to her and what I say to everyone is just be really open to any opportunity. You know, I've it, the professional work I've done has been in education, e-commerce, um, postage, um, energy sector, all of that in just a few years. I'd just be really open to any opportunity there is. Don't reject a job just because the sector isn't exactly what you were thinking of going into. Um, it's good to have an interest in the sector, of course, but it's not always the be all and end all, and you can always move around. Um, I'd also um, remind you that sometimes there are jobs in IT in the places that you would probably not look to uh, find them straight up for example there are very good graduate schemes with the supermarkets morrison's tesco's those sort of places uh, i initially looked at tesco and sky and national grid in the energy sector you know people think that we're a bunch of engineers but we also have roles in it finance hr goodness knows what else so as uh, was said earlier on the call um it's not a case of you must go and work for a firm where they're known for uh, delivering IT solutions or um, only deliver IT products. Every firm requires IT somewhere. Um, so I just be open to whatever you can find really. You do have to be a little bit agnostic about things. Um, if you can it helps if location is not too much of a tie as well. Um, but if you're young and just coming out of uni and don't have any commitments then the world really is your oyster and that's the time to really explore those kind of things isn't it no, fantastic you're absolutely right the the breadth of the industry now and and the sector you'll find yourself in it can be very very odd i mentioned earlier on about Ocado and the advancements in artificial mm -hmm. intelligence and things like that you wouldn't have put an online supermarket down as a big advancement of, of artificial intelligence but they absolutely are uh, but you're right as well, they'll need every kind of role in there. So they'll need technical support from, from day to day. I, I see work all the way through. So no, no, you're right. It, it, you may find yourself in a very weird um, industry. But as I say, if you've got even half an interest in it, it's fantastic. No, brilliant. Uh, Duncan, if I can come to you then, please. Uh, what, what would be your advice? My advice. So so um, I've written quite a few things down and been ticking them off as the, the, the panel's been going through. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, that's absolutely fine. So, so I think there's, there's there's three things. The first one is go and have a play. I'm I'm extremely envious of the amount of online things you can do now. Um, if you want to go and you know play with some coding or play with a quantum computer or do some UX design or design a game or there's online courses, there's free things available. You can just sign up, get access to these systems in the cloud, and go for it. I, I think if you if you do have a passion and an interest in a part of IT, um, I'm fairly certain there's somewhere somewhere you can actually just go and use it. And so I think don't go and have a play and, and see what 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 gets you really excited. Um, I, I think don't believe the hype. Um, so yeah, I I come from a scientific background, um, and I I think that there is a lot of hype in IT. And one of the things I try and pride myself on is, is looking through the hype and you know, computers only do as they're told. They're, they're machines at the end of the day. And, and I think if um, trying to ground yourself and think, how does this actually work? Um, I know this is what it says in the box, but actually trying to think about how it actually works is actually quite useful. And actually puts you when you when you start to have conversations with people, you're having fact based conversations. Um, and then. The, the the last bit is the last thing I think is is when you're if you do choose to go into IT think about the why as well as the how so a lot of folk get quite involved in how does it work but what is it being used for and why do people want to use it I think is is as if not more important so I think those would be my my three things 
No, absolutely. And that feeds very nicely as well into the, the conversation we're having around user experience as well. So it's not just the why, but it's the, the, the how people interact with that as bit as well. It's not just about technology. It's what's the big human bit. That's what humans are around to do as well. So fantastic. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Mark, I've left you to laugh. So you've probably, if you've got a list, they're probably all ticked off now, but fingers crossed there's a glimmer of something in there. Uh, so uh, have you, have you got any tips for the audience? I have, I've got a couple of things. One of them is building on um, some of what Jason was saying um, around seeking out opportunities and, and looking at them where they're, where you wouldn't necessarily have thought for, thought about them to start with. Um, but I was going to just add to that and say, don't sell yourself short. So if you're looking at a job ad, or if you're looking at what some an organization's requiring or what the, the course is covering and requiring, and you're thinking, well, I don't know that, or I've never worked on that, or I've not got that experience, don't, don't put yourself down and don't, take yourself out of the running for that job or that opportunity yourself let somebody else do that for you you know put yourself forward if you haven't got the skills in a particular area highlight it um highlight something that you have that could be an advantage to them um i mean I, i'm doing that even now and in, in, in my career there's opportunities that come up that i've got no experience for and i've um i've, I've said relative but i've never done anything like that um, one of them was recently a mergers and acquisitions um, opportunity came up and my CIO said, hey, Mark, can you go work on this? And it's like, I have got no experience in that. I, I wouldn't know where to begin. And it's like, it's fine. You do this. You've got these skills over here. That's transferable. And it's like, OK, um, I hadn't seen that for myself. And as I've been managing a, a team of project managers and recruiting, the number of opportunities that people come in and they put themselves, they've sold themselves short. And it's like, actually, you've got something there that I value. You're not valuing it, but I value it. Um, so just don't sell yourself short on things like that. Don't don't take yourself out of the running for those opportunities. Um, the other thing I'd say is just find something that interests you. Whatever area of IT you end up in, you're not stuck in it for life. But at least find the thing that interests you to start with and then grow from there. So if it's software development, for me it was antivirus, um, and that led me into C and C++ and Assembler. Um, I quickly outgrew that and got into databases. Um, but it changes, your interests will change and let that lead where you want your career to go. Absolutely, and with the fast pace that we see in, in development in IT as well, what the, the careers that will be available in 10 years time will look very different from what's available today. So you're absolutely right, it, it, like find something that interests you and also keep moving around, I guess, until you find that or until something else comes along that you're more interested in. But no, fantastic, no, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, so, John, final call out for audience questions. Have we had any in? Yes, we have one. Fantastic. Um, I'll let you read it because I can't see it. Okay, right. Dan Abbas is asking Duncan, he says, Hi, Duncan, could you shed more light on the IBM Extreme Blue program, please? When are students invited to apply for this? I can i i can send the link out if that would be useful actually if you search for ibm extreme blue on google it will it will pop up um, i think the application process and I, I i don't know for sure is is probably happening now um and there's a very defined straight application process you go through where you have um you send in your cv there's some online tests you then have a, a bigger application form to fill in and then you have what's called the discovery session where you you, you, you have you work through with a team on, on certain skills on certain tasks and you have an interview um, um, and then so that will be for 2022 entry um, it's all part of the IBM um, university scheme so as well as that we also have internships as well um, and obviously we also employ graduates as well after university so um, I don't know the practicalities about sending the link out, but I, I'm fairly certain. I will try it now. If you search for Extreme Blue IBM, um, it will come up with the correct website for you. Um, just, just for a while, I've worked on a couple of projects with people. We did one working with a very well-known retailer where we looked at micro segmentation of customers, um, and that involved them going to site, and we, we did lots of other stuff. We did a um, the one I did last year, which is actually a public, um, um, it, it's been sent out on the internet, was with Burberry, and we looked at sustainability with Burberry and how we would help them in their sustainability goals by producing a whole series of apps. Um, we got to work with their marketing directors directly. It's a really, really interesting program. 
fantastic. No, thank you very much. Um, now, I, you're all you're going to have to manage this yourself for who comes in next. But has anyone else got any programs similar to that that you know of in your own organisation that that people should kind of be directed towards? Yeah, National Grid do grass games every year. Unfortunately, uh, the 2022 entries, the the cut off date has just been, but a couple of roles may still be up there. So I would encourage you to look at National Grid's grad schemes anyway and just see if there's any that are still going. If not, definitely uh, sign up to be notified of when the new opportunities come out uh, next October or next November. Uh, I'm on their graduate scheme at the moment. The application is pretty similar to what Duncan described uh, from IBM's um, yeah, online sort of game assessment, online video interview, and then you get invited to the assessment centre where there's group activities and things like that. Um, it's pretty typical across most graduate schemes from most companies that you'll find. Um, but yeah, we've got a whole host of roles in IT, uh, everything from design to cyber security, which is a really popular and established one at GRID. Uh, to IT business management, software developing is now uh, coming in house to grid, so we're advertising for those as well. Um, yeah, for all sorts of things, uh, business partnering as well, so working with external organisations on IT systems, that sort of thing. Um, definitely recommend having a look into it. Great graduate scheme, uh, well paid and lots of good opportunities. Yeah, fantastic, thank you very much. Sorry, Kantar has. Oh yeah, carry on, Mark. Sorry, Kantar has a graduate scheme as well. So if you search their website, Kantar is K-A-N-T-A-R. Um, it's mainly around market research, but this year they took on some IT um, graduates as well for the first time. Um, the actual scheme's been running for many, many years for the market research kind of client services teams. Um, it's it's newer for the technology teams. I haven't got much, I haven't got details around it right now, um, but yeah, it, it's starting. So there's some potential opportunities there. And sorry, just to jump in this very quickly, we also do um, stall lever streams as well. So I know we've spoken about graduate streams, but you can join Strength and Stall with IBM if you'd like to. Um, and there's lots of folk I work with now um, who started that way and worked their way up through the company. So I think actually, if you don't fancy going to university and would like to go into, into an industry, then that's also a possibility. I should mention as well that National Grid also do internships, uh, placement years, and we also have apprenticeship schemes as well. So we've got most options covered. Um, there's a good chance as well that if you impress on the internship or the, uh, or the uh, placement year, then you'll have a very good chance of being enlisted automatically onto the graduate scheme as well. So then you've got a job after you need to potentially. Um, I know several students, well, several graduates who came into National Grid that way. Um, so definitely worth checking out the whole portfolio of um, career options available. Um, Cap Gemini. Oh, God, carry on, job. <laughs> yeah, Cap Gemini as well. Um, obviously, has our own graduate scheme, um, internship, apprenticeships, pretty much anything and everything, including. Um, Social co uh, corporate responsibility, reach out for charity engagements with um, helping people who are uh, new migrants to the country to be able to pick up IT skills through the Code for Your F Future scheme. We're heavily involved in the Prince's Trust, so we have a large number of um, education reach out and employment opportunities. Um, and again, it's not just in IT or cyber security. We've also got a very large um, management consultancy arm as well who take on interns and work their way through that process as well. So again, anybody at any level, we're always on the lookout for people who are interested. I'm going to leave a little bit more of a pause this time. But um, uh, what was going to say? Uh, I think the uh, the really interesting thing that I've just taken away from all that is we've to we've spoken about graduate schemes, but actually we've we've spoken about opportunities at every level. So you could already be established in a career, you could be just leaving school. There are opportunities in these organisations, and um, picking up on uh, I'm, I'm really sorry I can't remember who mentioned it earlier on, but picking up on the idea of let the organisation you're applying to knock you out of the running for it based on you applying, rather than you looking at it early on and going that doesn't really fit for me. 
there are lots of opportunities out there where your CV, your, your portfolio might just end up in front of the right person who may not think you're right for the role you've gone for, but might think you're right for something else. There's plenty of opportunities out there. So don't count yourself out, out early and don't think I can't do X because I'm not a graduate. There are all sorts of entry routes into those kinds of things. Oh, fantastic, thank you. Um, for, does anyone else want to jump in on their schemes or entry points at the moment? I'll take that as a no, in which case, John, shall I come back to you for questions? Do we have any more in? 